Well, welcome to Warhol in the West. This is a major traveling exhibition that the Booth Museum was able to put together with two other partners, the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City, where it goes next, and the Tacoma Art Museum in Tacoma, Washington, which is where it'll finish the run. And it was a true three-way partnership of the three museums putting this together. We kind of organized it, got the art together, and arranged the loans. The uh, Cowboy Museum in Oklahoma City arranged the logistics, the shipping, the insurance, all the, uh, those kind of details. And then the uh, Museum in Washington, Tacoma Art Museum, they handled the production of the catalog, a 144-page book on this exhibition which has its genesis in my master's thesis that I published academically in 2005. And so that was about 35, 38,000 words. They made me take it all the way down to 7,500 words, which is about the hardest thing to do in writing. I'd rather write 100,000 words than do that again. But um, that became the basis for the introduction to the book. But there are 18 other contributors to the book. And to think that you could have a 144-page book on a part of an artist's career who's the most overhyped, over-exhibited, over-talked about artist ever in the history of the world, right. and find 144 pages that hadn't been said yet, it's pretty mind-blowing, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. that's what this exhibition's all about. So I say to people, we're doing a show on Andy Warhol's Western mm -hmm. art, they say, I didn't know he did Western art, <laughs> <laughs> which is the whole point of the exhibition. So if we're going to begin, let's begin at the beginning, shall we? Yes. Let's do it. So right here in this case, Andy comes to Western art the same way just about everybody else does that was around his age, most of them are a little older than you guys, and that would be through what? Movies. Western movies, that's correct. Andy said his most favorite times growing up as a youngster were going to the movies. Now he's born around 1930, so he would have seen a lot of Western movies growing up, right? Did you know that Andy Warhol and Mr. Rogers we're born six months apart, 20 miles apart. <laughs> Just found that out the other day. Yeah. Yeah. We saw the uh, Mr. Rogers movie and realized that. Yeah. But Andy was fascinated with celebrity from his earliest days. I mean, he just was infatuated with celebrity. And he kept this scrapbook of celebrity portraits. And you could buy them for a penny each in a little arcade his brothers would take him to or they would help him write letters to the stars and ask them for signed ones and they would send them to him in the mail. And he kept them in this portfolio, he had his entire life. But look who the biggest picture in the portfolio was of. Anybody know who that is? The horse or the guy? Oh. Oh, I've seen him. Oh, um, oh yeah. Gene Autry. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Famous horse. Yeah. Which is really apropos this time of year because he did here comes Santa Claus and right. Rudolph the Red Nosed right. Reindeer. Oh, Those are oh his my songs. God. Yeah. Right. What was the oh horse's name? He do baby as full time. Champion, right? Champion. Mm -hmm. And guess what he also had? A Roy Rogers alarm clock. Mm -hmm. Roy Rogers <laughs> also. So he liked Gene, he liked Roy. Maybe he's not as strange as we think he is. You know? <laughs> no, he is. <laughs> but at least he liked Gene and Roy. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good point. He also had these little giant books in the next case there. And these are all about the West. Wow. Buffalo Bill and Buck Jones and the Plainsman and the Virginian. All these little giant books. Later in life, he always carried a, a um, Polaroid camera with him. He was always shooting Polaroids. Those little red books are little um, portfolios he would put together of his Polaroids on a particular theme. This one has 20 Polaroids in it. They're all Indian artifacts, like the two that are pulled out. Now later on we'll find out what a hoarding collector he was and how interested he was in collecting Indian stuff. But this book is also an indication of that as well. We don't know if these are things that were in his collection, things he wanted or lusted after or just had seen somewhere, but they were in the collection. Most interviewers who ever described what Andy was wearing when they went to visit him said he was wearing cowboy boots. There are 27 pair of Andy's cowboy boots at the Andy Warhol Museum in his hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have five of them here on view right now. If you look closely at the ones around the bottom, you'll see they're paint covered. Smudges of paint on them all over. So we know he was wearing those in the studio when he was painting. The pair in the center at the front there is pretty pristine. That's probably the pair he kept under the desk to wear to Studio 54 in the evenings after a hard day of painting. <laughs> and maybe he would have worn one of these felt hats or even the sheriff's back polo tie. 
I've never been able to find a picture of him wearing this tie, but I haven't given up yet. I think it'd be pretty cool to see. There's a new sheriff in town, and his name's Andy Warhol. <laughs> now, one of his really good friends is the guy over here on the wall. Anybody recognize him? Nope. Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper. Now, Dennis Hopper was a good friend of Andy's throughout his entire life. He also was a very important fan and collector of modern art. In fact, he bought one of the Campbell soup cans out of the first show that Andy did in California. Now, the owner of the gallery begged Dennis to sell it back to him after the show because he wanted to keep them all together in case they were ever important. So that was about a $25 million mistake on Dennis Hopper's part. There's also a report that Dennis and Andy owned an Indian art store in Taos, New Mexico together for a little while. Now, who remembers a movie starring Dennis Hopper where a cowboy hat is a pivotal part of the plot? Very Giant. important. Giant, very good. Ding, 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 gold star. <laughs> so Rock Hudson plays the dad. James Dean and Dennis Hopper play the young cowboys. And at one point in the movie, Dennis goes to put a hat on. He's been given by his dad for Christmas. And it doesn't fit. It just goes down around his ears. And it's a literal interpretation that he's not man enough or big enough to be the giant his father was and to take over. Mm. Anybody watch Yellowstone? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Same story, right? Yes. Yeah. So guess what Andy did when he came to do Dennis's portrait? He did a little solid for his buddy and made sure the hat fit this time. <laughs> Now, the video you're watching in the center is part of a collection called Screen Tests. And these are things Andy would do for anybody from the mailman to a celebrity coming in the studio. He put them in a chair in front of a video camera, a film camera, with about 100 feet of film in it, which would last three or four minutes. He'd flip it on and walk away. Mm -hmm. It was kind of his way of putting people kind of off their game or maybe making them feel as uncomfortable as he did. And so these are called Screen Tests. And there's about four or five hundred of them in the Warhol Museum. And some of them do what Dennis is doing. To me, it looks like he's trying to stare down at the camera and melt the camera with laser vision or something. Other people would fumble with their fingers, play with their hair, smoke a cigarette. It's just an interesting study in human nature. And really, that's what Andy was all about in a lot of ways. In the uh, corner there, there's a poster for a British movie produced after Andy was, was, was uh, passed on. But in 1968, he was shot by a lady who came in his studio, busted in the studio, shot one of the people visiting the studio, hit Andy twice. The third bullet probably would have killed him, but the gun jammed. Hmm. They went to the hospital. He spent seven hours on the table. And at one point, they gave him last rites. They thought he was dead. But he survived through it. But he dealt with the physical and psychological issues of that the rest of his life. He often wore a girdle. In fact, most of the time he had a girdle on to keep his guts in place. And so dealing with that his whole life, in addition to his blotchy skin and white hair, thinning hair, which a result of a childhood disease he had called St. Vitus Dance, which is a complication from scarlet fever. And that's why he looked kind of different and was always self-conscious about that. Now, it's interesting, when he gets shot in 68, he comes back later and does a series on guns and knives this piece is part of that series, and it's pretty similar to the gun he was shot with. So is that a cathartic thing, him dealing with those issues many years later, trying to deal with it? I don't know. If we start an psychoanalyzing Andy, we're off in the abyss pretty quick, so we might better stay away from that. So back to the premise of the exhibition that Andy Warhol did some Western art. The first piece you can really call Western in his over would be this Elvis, which is pretty early in his career. It's the second big show we had in California in the early 60s. And they said Andy's gift was to be a mirror to America. Remember I talked about Ross and reflecting America and what's great about America? Andy was trying to reflect what was America, literally. Held up a mirror and said, you are Elvis, you are Marilyn Monroe, you're Liza Minnelli, you're Jackie O. You're celebrity and the stars and the fame and all those things, but you're also Campbell's Soup, Heinz Ketchup, Coca-Cola, and Brillo. These commodities, these things that are all the same. One of the quotes we have downstairs is a little teaser exhibit about Coca-Cola and Andy's relationship with Coca-Cola. He said one of the great things about Coke is it doesn't matter who you are. If you're the president, you're Liz Taylor, or me sitting at home, 
I can drink the same Coke. We're all drinking the same Coke. You can't buy a better one. Right? That's what's great about America. Now, Andy could have done Elvis as a teen singing sensation, right? It could be shown from the waist up only, right? That would have been Americana. He could have shown Andy as a teen singing sensation who became a matinee movie idol. That might have been double Americana. But he goes all in. Teen singing sensation, matinee movie idol, gun-wielding cowboy western movie star. Triple Americana. Triple Elvis. Right? Maybe he's saying more about America than we think. So these paintings, there's about 30 in this body of work. If we could get one here, it would have cost more to do that than the rest of the exhibition put together. So we didn't do that. The people that have them don't loan them because they're 50 to $100 million a piece and they're falling apart because they use some really cheap materials. But you get the effect here. You also get the effect that he's not just an American phenomenon. This was a British production company that did this movie. Look at the face of the actress who played the woman who shot him. Look what they did with her body. Now this image comes from a movie called Flaming Star in which Elvis plays the son of a Native American woman and a gringo father. <laughs> and there's only two songs in the whole movie, so it's really different than every other Elvis movie where it's just a plot excuse to get from one song to the next. Right. This one, he was playing a real actor who is playing the role of being tugged in both directions and doesn't know whether he should be on the Indian or the cowboy side of this battle that's going on. And it's a very violent movie. If you ever get the chance to watch it, which I don't necessarily recommend, but What's the title of it? Flaming Star. Mm -hmm. But again, the part about him being an international sensation, this body of work winds up being shown in Canada and in Germany. This poster is from Cologne, Germany. The Germans are nuts about the American West as they are about Andy Warhol. And so Andy and the West is kind of a double slam dunk in Germany. But what's more American than Howdy Doody? Most of y'all aren't old enough to have seen Howdy Doody. But there were 2,000 or more episodes of Howdy Doody. It's Howdy Doody time. It's Howdy Doody time. Nobody remembers the third line. It's Howdy Doody time. But one of the cool things about this exhibition that makes it really fun is to be able to see these Polaroid photographs or the silver gelatin and the regular film photographs, but particularly the Polaroids that Andy used to shoot these himself and then use them to turn them into these celebrity portraits. And the way the flash of the Polaroid with the Polaroid film looked, it really flattened the image to begin with and put some highlights in places that Andy really worked with. And if, so if you look at Dennis Hopper, you look at Howdy, and some of the other ones we'll see as we go along, compare how the Polaroid looks with the finished print. Now, a lot of these he did in the 80s, like this one, he really blinged them out. 80s was the bling time, right? So he put what he called diamond dust on these prints. Now, it's really just crushed glass, but in Andy Warhol's world, that's diamond dust. <laughs> and you'll see a couple more of those as we go along, too. Okay. Now, at one point, Andy said he was going to give up painting and he was going to become a full-time filmmaker. And he made a number of films. But some of them weren't that interesting, like the eight-and-a-half-hour half epic called Empire State Building, <laughs> which was eight-and-a-half hours of the Empire State Building. Now, if you haven't seen that, Spoiler alert, <laughs> Don't go. nothing happens. <laughs> he also did one in six hours called Sleep. The guy might roll over, I think, twice in the six hours. Of the <laughs> but he did try to make some uh, films that had at least some kind of plot to them. Not much, but this one right here on the uh, right there is called Horse. Go figure. Right? They bring this horse up into his studio. They put four or five guys in cowboy outfits and they start filming. Now Andy was worried it would look too real, using his words. So you can see the light fixture and the mic boom were both sticking in the frame, so it wouldn't look real. Now I don't know how it's ever going to look real, because that's the door to the studio behind him. To the left is the elevator door, 
behind that's his pay phone. <clears throat> and in a two hour film, people are coming and going the whole time they're doing this. They're ducking out of the way when they realize they're filming. There's a strip poker game that breaks out at one point. There's a fist fight that breaks out at one point. And at the very end, the guy's standing in his underwear singing an opera aria. <laughs> this was Andy's Ode to the Horse Operas, which is what sometimes they derisively call those Gene and Roy movies we started with. Instead of soap, soap operas, they call them horse operas. So this is Andy's horse opera, literally. Now, he was worried about that looking too real. He decided then to go the other direction and try to make it as real as possible when he does this movie in 1968-69 called Lonesome Cowboys. It's kind of the forerunner to Brokeback Mountain. It's a two-hour film, and this is basically the whole script. So it lets you know how much of it was done improv versus scripted. And he rents out Old Tucson, which is a famous filming location for Westerns near Tucson, Arizona, which had become sort of a theme parkish place. You could go and they had like a fake saloon and they had tacky trinket stores and you could do the old time photos and things, but they were still making films there. Andy rents it out, they're filming away. When you rented the studio, you got these technical guys that came with it. Now these are guys who made a lot of movies and they said, what the heck's with these guys? Every time they do the scene, it's different. Well, they got no script to work from and they said nobody ever else cut. Well, they didn't. They just put the roll of film on, they let it run until it ran out, put another one on, just kept filming. There were no scenes to speak of, they just figured it out when they got it in the editing studio. Now, everything you need to know about this film is right here. Lonesome Cowboys is a magnificent and very funny satire of the American Western, liberally seasoned with our favorite four, eight, ten, and twelve letter words. <laughs> Never mind, we'll figure that out later, right? A cornucopia of nudity and sexual carryings on that is in combination perhaps unprecedented. It's everything you need to know. In 1968 and 69 it wins the San Francisco Film Festival for Best Film. Here in Atlanta there was an FBI raid at the art theater where it was being shown. They seized the print for being pornographic. I've had now two people on tours who said they saw it at that theater before it was seized. They were lucky they weren't there on the day when the raid happened. But, you know, they look like cowboys to you. These are German lobby cards. They're actually in German. And again, just points out the international sensation of interest in the West and of Andy's work. But it looks like he's pretty engaged, doesn't it? I mean, he's now. Looks like yeah. he's actually working, yeah. he's not just standing back and directing. Wearing yeah. the hat, right. <laughs> So on the two monitors we have five minutes of carefully selected G-rated highlights. <laughs> because there's a simulated rape scene in the middle of this movie that the people who had brought their kids to Old Tucson that day were a little freaked out by, as you might imagine. So the next day when they showed up to film, the FBI was there. And so they bugged out to a private ranch nearby in Oro Valley and finished the filming. But we've selected these five minutes of highlights for you. You want to see any more than that? That's between you and the internet. Okay? So three Western artists that he did their portraits during his career. This one being Fritz Scholder. Probably the best known Native American artist of all times. And Andy does his portrait. And one of the really cool things I found in the Andy Warhol archives after being locked in there at two different sessions for three days was this letter from Fritz writing to Andy saying how much he enjoyed the portraits and was very happy with them. I'm sure Andy was real thrilled to know that. But he also thanks them for showing a good time when they were in New York. So Andy had hosted them on their visit when they came to have the Polaroid shot to then do the portraits. Also, Native American artist, very well known, R.C. Gorman over here. The New York Times referred to him as the Indian Picasso. And he does his portrait as well. Now, both of these guys use the fact that Andy had done their portraits to sell their work. The next couple of shows they have on the invitation, it says, come see my portrait by Andy Warhol. And that means I must be a famous artist and you should buy my work, right? Now, the artist that he did who didn't need that kind of help, of course, is this lady, Georgia O'Keeffe. She's the only other artist that would probably be in the conversation for best known American artist in the 20th century. Maybe Ansel Adams, maybe Norman Rockwell, 
but really it's Andy in Georgia, don't you think? And it was actually on a visit to Andy's studio, depicted over there, that they jinxed it. Don't do this, okay? They talked about what to do on her 100th birthday, and she died at 98 and a half. So don't do that. Don't talk about what you're going to do on your 100th birthday. Right. <laughs> Now, we talked about Andy being a mirror to America and holding up that mirror and showing America who and what they are, right? Now, Andy's famous quote was, there's just the surface. If you scratch the surface of his work, there was nothing below it. No political intent, no social commentary, no artistic comments. It is what it is. Well, I call BS on that, at least on some of his work. And I introduced, for your consideration, exhibits A and B in that argument. In 1976, what are we celebrating? Our bicentennial. American's bicentennial. 200 years of being a great country. Hoorah, which we are. But Andy chooses that moment to ask somebody, who's the most radical Native American living today? And several people come back to him and tell him it's probably this guy, Russell Means, who was part of AIM, the American Indian Movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Remember they seized Alcatraz, Wounded Knee, those types of things. So Andy chooses to do a series of portraits that are again exhibited internationally as well as in America, saying, yeah, you're celebrating 200 years of being a great country, but in 400 years you haven't figured out the Indian question. Think there's coincidence in that timing? I don't. So maybe it's more than just the surface, at least sometimes. Now Andy dies early in 1987 from complications of a, what should have been a rather routine gallbladder surgery. But because of complications perhaps from when he was shot that we talked about earlier, after a relatively successful surgery in a private room with a private nurse in a private hospital, he dies. They've never been able to determine exactly for sure why and how that happened. So it's mysterious circumstances. Mm -hmm. Do -do 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 -do. <laughs> but in his will, he directs a small chunk of money relatively to go to each of his brothers, everything else he owns to be sold for the benefit of creating the Andy Warhol Foundation for Visual Arts, which now has given away several hundred millions of dollars for arts-related projects. And a lot of the original impetus for that came from the sale of goods in his home. When they went to his house, roughly 15-room house, looked like three rooms were lived in, the other 15 were full of stuff. He went shopping almost every day. He bought stuff almost every day when he was in New York, brought it home, almost never unpacked it. He was a hoarding collector. In this case are two of the catalogs for a 10-day auction. The Sotheby's team came and cataloged 10,000 items in his home. And it took 10 days nonstop to sell it all. Among the items in the catalog were 300 Curtis photographs of American Indians, of which nine are shown in this picture. They're the same nine that are right here. He also had a lot of art by other artists he had collected, including this Maxfield Parrish painting shown in the catalog. Also in the catalog is a lot of cowboy and celebrity movie star portraits. Gary Cooper happens to be the one they put in the catalog. In these cases over here in the center, you'll see the box set of all the catalogs for the sale. And you'll start to see some of the Indian artifacts that he owned, like this Chilcat blanket on the far wall, that's Northwest Coast style, a Navajo blanket here on the floor, these tomahawks, a dagger, Apache water bottle, mask. He had a lot of jewelry. These are spoons made out of antlers. And what you see right here, this is the box set of the catalogs for the 10-day auction. That's how much stuff there was. This catalog laying in the case here is just the Indian stuff. One whole day of the 10 days was his American Indian collection. And he never would have had it displayed like this in his house, but you can see they fluffed the house. They brought out all the stuff for people to see. These were shot by Sotheby's staff photographers. But Home and Garden Magazine hired a famous photographer to come shoot this as well while they had it staged. Now, how ironic would it be that this one particular photographer might have been hired to do that? Anybody got a guess? Robert Maplethorpe was brought in. 
If you don't know who he is, Google him later. On the back wall here is a body of work called Sunsets. Again, very original titling. It's based on a movie that's showing there on the monitor called Sunset. And guess what? Something actually happens in this movie. The sun sets. Oh my God. But this body of work was commissioned by Philip Johnson, the famous architect for a hotel in Minneapolis that was having 400 odd rooms. They commissioned over 500 of these, every one to be a different color. So they had an original Warhol in every room, plus they had some attic stock, plus they had extras for the uh, shareholders and so on. Now, how did they make these? These are silk screens. Bulk of Andy's work is based on a silk screening project. So even those Russell Means paintings, which are actually painted, start with a silk screen outline laid down on the canvas, and then Andy would paint on top of that. Most of his work where he made his money was silk screen projects that were 10 prints done around a theme. So for instance, the two back there, the uh, Bighorn Ram and the American Eagle, those are two from a endangered species project that he did. And so people realized there was big money in sponsoring Andy to do these projects based on 10 images in a theme. And so they would start with the idea in those 10 subjects. They would then do what we call trial proofs. So this one is going to be Sitting Bull, one of the images from the Cowboys and Indians suite. And you would have started with a photograph of Sitting Bull. And then you'd have your box of 64 crayons, right, essentially. And you've got to invent your own color by number. And you're not going to start by thinking about what colors, but how many. So how many colors do you want to have in the finished print? And in this case, it was six. So you're going to do a color separation from the original photograph to create a transparency of each part of the image that's going to be a different color. Okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six. We got our color by number. You're going to take that transparency, burn it into the screen that has an emulsion on it where it's now cream colored, when you put a pile of pigment, which is essentially like a poster paint or an acrylic paint up here on the top, you're going to squeegee it down through the screen and force the pigment through those areas onto the paper. And you're going to do that each time for each color. And you're going to make sure you put the screen down in the same place all six times or it gets all wonky looking. So yellow, red, black, blue, mauve, white highlights at the very end and you build this print up to be one possible combination of colors. Now in the trial proofing process they're trying to determine what is the magical combination of colors to get to the right print that we're going to make 250 copies of for the finished project. Okay. Now the magic number was always 36. They did 36 versions of this, 36 different color combinations. Why 36? I don't know. My guess is that's how many would sit on the floor around the size of the room they were working in. So they just kept pulling them until they had the walls full, and 36 became the magic number. So those three over there represent three in the range of what would have actually been 36 possibilities. So if you can imagine standing in this room with 36 of those around the room, and you've got to pick one you're going to do 250 of, what would you use as your criteria for picking the best, the one to be used? Anybody got a thought? The one that was um, the reddest. Okay. The what? Ding, 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 ding. Gold star. This is Andy Warhol we're talking about. Not an aesthetic genius like Ross. Andy's worried about which one's going to sell the best because Andy said the best art is business art. And the art is the artist who makes the most money must be the best artist. So out of these three, which one would sell the best? How many like the one on the left? I like first one. Yeah, first one. Okay, raise your hand. All right, how many like the one in the middle? Okay, how many like the one on the right? How many don't give a damn? <laughs> All right, so when we go to the other room, we're going to find out how many people agree with Andy, okay? We're not giving it away yet. So just remember which one you voted for, okay? Last thing here is to talk just briefly about John Wayne. 
It was the publisher's responsibility on these projects to get any rights that might have been needed. The publisher on this project, Kent Kleinman, who actually had out negotiated Andy's business guys and got full artistic control of this project, something Andy bitches about in his diary the whole last year of his life, saying, how could Fred let this happen? How could he let this guy get control of the project? It was the only time it ever happened in Andy's life. And it damn near might have killed him. Who knows? I mean, he really was aggravated by it. But the guy told Andy that he had permission to do John Wayne when, in fact, he didn't. So they pick one of the images, they run 250 John Waynes, they finish the 10 pieces, which they had actually experimented with 14, which again was something he never did. The guy kept changing his mind and they did four extra ones, which is a lot of extra work they didn't need to do. One of those they had done was John Wayne. They get the portfolios finished, they start shipping them to the people who had pre-purchased them. And then Patrick Wayne shows up. And Patrick Wayne rides in and goes, boy, do you boys owe me a heap of money. Because they didn't have permission. So you can do one piece of a celebrity and you're fine. The minute you do two that are the same, now you're into licensing and probably some money. So they go to federal court. The John Wayne estate sues the Andy Warhol company. So to try to get around it, they say, okay, we're going to get all of these back. We're going to make them all unique. So people who had put up their money a year and a half in advance and had just gotten their series of Cowboys and Indians get a letter that says, you need to send your John Wayne back. We're going to fix it. We're going to change part of the color on it, but make it unique. Well, that sounded attractive because a unique piece theoretically ought to be worth more money, right? So they dutifully ship them back, get them to New York. And I know two guys in LaGrange who own these that then had shipped them back and a week and a half later Andy dies. And they go, oh my God, what's going to happen to my Andy Warhol, John Wayne? Well, about two months later they get him back. Jason Rupert Smith, who did most of the printing on this work, was still around. He took them in the studio and changed them. On one of the guys they changed the color of the gun, on the other one they changed the color of the bandana. And where it used to say 10 of 250, they erased that and put the word unique. That was their strategy. It didn't work. The judge saw right through that. <laughs> they wound up settling this out of court. We don't know for how much. It was a chunk of change. And when some things from John Wayne Estate came up for sale at auction a few years ago, there was a full set of Cowboys and Indians in it, including a John Wayne, which is the highest selling piece from this body of work that we're going to see in a moment that's ever been sold, about $160,000 to the John Wayne from the John Wayne estate, even though John Wayne was long dead before they did it. But his kids owned it, so that made it worth more money. So everything we've seen in this room are a reflection of Andy's love of the West, the Western things he had done in his career, leading up to the creation of the Cowboys and Indian suite that includes these guys. So let's go see what that looks like. So the Booth Western Art Museum owns everything in this room except for this painting back here behind me. And when I took this job in 2000 and began investigating what was a fairly traditional Western art collection, this seemed like such an anomaly. An anomaly within Western art, an anomaly within what the collector had put together, an anomaly within Andy's career. I mean, again, we started with, I didn't know Andy did anything Western. But because this was the last project he did before he died, it never got much traction, never really got that much look. And in most of the shows that they do of Andy's retrospective work, this doesn't get included. It's not considered that important, necessarily. But it's hugely important to us who study the West. It seemed an anomaly within Western art as a whole, and it also asked a lot of questions about why did Andy do it, when did he do it, and what impact might it have had on other people who do Western art. So all of those questions culminated in me deciding to do my master's thesis on Andy in 2003, completing it in 2005. Part of that project included describing this exhibition you see today. So that's 15 years ago that I was working on this project. So it's taken that long to pull it together and pull it to fruition and produce the uh, catalog in the uh, case down there we talked about earlier. 
So I mentioned Kent Kleinman, the general who is the publisher, changing his mind several times and then winding up dealing with 14 images, which is what you see on the wall, rather than the standard 10 in all these other projects. So they do trial proofs of 14 of these. And on Sitting Bull, they actually had picked one. Those of you who picked the one in the middle, you see the small square little one to the right? That's the one in the middle. That's the one they picked. They had already run 250 of those, and the publisher changes his mind and says, no, I don't like Sitting Bull anymore. I want to do Geronimo. So Geronimo shoves Sitting Bull out of the way, and we wind up with 250 sitting in the warehouse when he dies. They eventually were filtered out through the foundation and sold to the public. They're separate from the rest of the project. So I'm giving you that as a freebie. That means there's three in this room that don't make the cut. Okay. So take just a couple of minutes, look around, see what your three see. The three weakest ones are the three that you would not pick to be in the front of the might not have been struck by the idea that the word liberty has been put in the face of an Indian right. and that he's being made to stare at the word liberty. Yeah. Now, do you think there's any social commentary there? Yes. Maybe. Huh? So Indian nickel, Indian head nickel does make the cut, which means that if you had both the heads and tails of the nickel, might that be a little redundant? <coughs> So maybe it was a coin flip, and maybe it came up heads, because heads makes it in, tails doesn't make it in. All right, so we have Sitting Bull out, we have Geronimo in, we have Annie Oakley in, we have Indian Head Nickel in, we have Buffalo Nickel out. Who's next? He's out. He's out. Uh, Roosevelt. Roosevelt is in. No! I think that's all. I don't like to be a friend. All right, so let's deal with all three of these down here. The Plains Indian Shield, the Kachina Dolls, the Northwest Coast Mass, they all make the cut. Hold on one second. So these three objects that you see in the Polaroids, these all belong to the National Museum of the American Indian, which at the time was in New York City, not on the Mall of D.C. Andy actually got in a cab with a historian, went up to the museum, which was in Harlem, the Hay Center, and shot the images of all three of these objects and came back and turned them into the soapstones you see. He also made paintings of these three objects, which
which if he had really fully 100% completed this project, he would have eventually done paintings of the 10 that make the cut. Because the way they marketed these was to show an exhibit of the 10 paintings at a gallery, offer those for sale. The art press would come and review the show, but the real purpose was to get people there to sell them the prints. The paintings were just gravy, and they priced them really high, but you could buy the prints for a thousand bucks a piece, but you had to buy all 10. And then as soon as they sold a few, the price went up to 1500 then 2000 Business art, right? So those three are in. What about this one right here? In or out? In. It is out. <laughs> the, uh, it is based on a very famous painting by Charles Schreibogel on the left called Breaking Through the Lines. It belongs to the Tulsa Gilchrist Museum. We are so appreciative to have that on loan. But when I interviewed Kent Kleinman, the publisher, who was the only person directly involved in this project still alive when I was doing the project, said, and I said, why not this one? It's my favorite one. And he said, well, look at it. Look at all the rest. The rest are all static portraits or still lives. There's just too much going on in it. It doesn't go with the rest. Well, I don't give a damn. I still like it. Yeah. All right, now which one were you going to say? I'm sorry. No, I cut you off really. yeah. All right, well, you got, you got uh, two out of three chains left. So is it Custer, Warbonnet yeah. Indian, or Geronimo? Or David Geronimo? So is it Custer or Warbonnet Indian? We're buying it in the end. We're buying it. We're buying it in or out? Out. We're buying it is out. You are correct. So Custer makes it in. And notice again he has Custer in saintly white. Think there's any commentary there? Custer's the uh, saintly white martyr. There's a piece of work that Fritz Shoulder did in our permanent collection called American Landscape. 1876-1976. It's a takeoff of a Paxson painting that shows Custer also in white, the sky in blue, and everybody else in the picture is blood red. And so it kind of is his thoughts about it. I don't know that Warhol hadn't seen that piece of work when he chose to do Custer in white. Now this image has been the bugaboo of my existence relative to this project for 16 years. Because if you were going to cheat on this whole exercise, you would have immediately gone over there to that label, which is a copy of the colophon, which is when you do a print project like this, you would list all the prints, how many were done, how many trial proofs, how many publishers proofs, how many horse to commerce, what paper it was printed on, who printed it, what the source of all the images was. And if you look on that, it lists the 10 that make the cut and the source of the image. The four that don't make the cut, we have to find out on our own. Now this gets relatively easy for the first three. Buffalo nickel, obvious. Sitting Bull, that's a famous photograph. The action picture here, that's a famous painting. Doesn't take long to deduce those. This one, on the other hand, all it said in any of the notes anywhere was a still from a Western movie. Hmm. Leaves a lot to cover, right? So for 16 years, I've been asking Western historians, movie historians, and spending a lot of late nights going through movie poster catalogs and the like, trying to find the source of this image. We were ready to go to press with the book saying, we still don't know. <laughs> when the graphic designer of the book, a hotshot young kid in Davis, California, puts this image in a Google reverse image search and finds the source of the photograph. <laughs> a publicity still for the movie White Feather from 1955. So I've been looking for the source of this image for 16 years. He found it in three nanoseconds. <laughs> Isn't technology great? <laughs> but the, uh, the it is not exact. Okay, right. This is not an exact match. Right. Okay? The angle is not exactly correct. But it is this guy in this movie with that spear undoubtedly in that picture right. now so it's either the frame right here yeah. or the frame right here on that roll of film oh, gotcha. okay which yeah. haven't found the exact one but it's definitely from this film What's the movie called? white feather 1955 that was a great year okay that's a tour through andy warhol's western art i hope you've enjoyed it Thank you so much.
much. That was fantastic. So if you've really enjoyed it, we'd love to have you consider becoming a member of the family and joining as a member of the museum. That's the ultimate flattering thing for us.